This is the video for uh, section 11.3. All right, so um, remember that there were two different kinds of two sample t-tests. One looked at dependent samples, which were things like before and after, or um, a husband and wife in a couple. The idea that you're really measuring one thing from two different directions, and each point matches up with another point somehow in the uh, sample. Independent samples is not that, and that's what this section is about. Independent samples is where we have two different groups. And the question is, are those two groups really from different populations or really from the same population? You can't really tell the difference between them. So um, I used uh, men and women as an example, freshmen and sophomore an example back there in uh, the beginning of chapter 11. Um, Anyway, um, the example that Dr. Love gives in her slides, which I think is a pretty good one, was looking from a group of students who graduated from a high school in 1992 and looking at the ones who finished a college degree and comparing the ones who started at a two-year school versus those who started immediately at a four-year school. Now, we know they aren't randomly assigned to those two groups, um, right, because students make choices about whether to go to four-year school or two-year school, or they don't have the scores, or they want to go to a certain kind of school or whatever. Anyway, that's a different question because we're just looking at the data here. But the question is, is that different really significant, or is it um, close enough that you can't really tell? So here's the summary data that we have, and um, you can see that there is, in fact, a difference between those who started a community college and a four-year school. 4.43 years versus 5.43 years. The question is whether or not that difference is significant or are you close enough? You're like, eh, it's pretty close. The standard deviation, of course, is gonna be key to figure that out. And you can see the standard deviations are about the same, but that'll give us the idea of a sample error, which will tell us whether or not those differences are um, sort of coincidental or whether those differences are significant. Notice that our sample size in this example is pretty gigantic. We had 268 who got a four-year degree started at a community college and 1,145 who started right at a four-year school. Okay, and we're interested in whether we have evidence that the means are different or the means are the same, right? You can write it either like this where you're saying the one is bigger than the other or that the difference between them is positive. Now we're gonna to refer to these as sample one and sample two, and it doesn't matter which one is which, but what you do wanna do is keep the same one and two throughout the whole story, especially because sometimes we'll have a one-sided test. And so that direction of the sign will be important, right? And we know that, um, you know, certainly if the new medicine worked worse than the placebo, that wouldn't be significant in the good way. Okay, so, um, the natural estimator is going to be this difference in means. Notice that we don't call it D like we did in the match pairs case, because the idea there was that D was itself a separate variable. Here, we really are thinking of the two groups as different. So that sample mean difference is going to still be important. For the standard deviation, we're going to use what's called the pooled mean, where we smush the two means, I'm sorry, the two sample, the two standard deviations together. So we're going to do the pooled standard deviation. And this is a weighted average where we take each one and we weight it by the sample size that goes with it. We combine them inside the square root sign. Remember that you can't square root first and then add, right? That's one of those things that your, I don't know, your eighth grade teacher got mad at you about. So the idea that you put the square root over the whole thing and you calculate it. In practice, we're gonna do this in StatCrunch or a spreadsheet, but that is important if you do ever calculate this by hand. So the confidence interval is gonna have the formula that we know from chapter nine, but the difference in the means is now going to have two points. The T, we're going to figure out what our degrees of freedom are here on the next slide. And then this pooled standard deviation. So it's still a point estimate plus or minus a critical value times a, sam a standard error, which gives you a margin of error. But there's a lot more numbers floating around, right? We have six because we have X bar one and X bar two, S1 and S2, and N1 and N2, right? And the chart kind of showed all of those in one place. So instead of having three numbers, we have six numbers plus the T. We still need to have our assumptions met where the samples are independent. So again, they can't influence each other. The samples are just taken. <clears throat> we have to assume that they're good samples. And again, chapter one taught us about that. And we either have to think that the population is normally distributed or we have to have a big sample size. And in this case, we're gonna say that both samples have an N bigger than 30. 
For degrees of freedom, we're going to use the smaller sample size minus one, and that gives us a conservative test. So in this case, we're going to use 268 minus one, and that's still a giant sample size. So that's fine. Um, your computer actually does something a little fancier where it does kind of an average of the two in a kind of a cool weighted way. The formula for that's in the book, but it's really big. So no one ever does that by hand. By hand, we always just use this. Also remember that as your sample size grow, it just gets a little bit closer. So the exact degrees of freedom is sort of a technical detail, but it's an important one. Now we go through the steps just like we did for hypothesis tests otherwise. So our null hypothesis says there's no difference mu1 minus mu2 equals zero. You can write that as mu1 equals mu2, but often we write it this way. The alternate hypothesis is that the difference is not zero. And again, that can be one-sided with a greater than or less than sign, or it can just be not equal to. Like I just said a second ago, it doesn't matter which one is uh, greater than or less than, as long as you match it up with the mu1 and mu2, right? That if you're looking at which one is bigger, then the direction becomes super important. We pick our alpha, often we use 0.05, um, alpha over two is 0.025, but you can use different ones if you want to be more significant in order to find that. Then we plug them into our formula. And again, it's the same formula, T is over here. That's going to be the number we'd look up in the table to see. Often the number bigger than two is a sign that it's pretty big. Um, but now our formula has gotten more different because we have two x bars minus our hypothesized difference. Often that difference is going to be zero if we're looking for any difference at all. Um, the only case where that's really not true is if you're looking at something where both should have some progress. Um, so for instance, if you're comparing your scores at the beginning of fourth grade um, to a group of fifth graders, um, you would expect the fifth graders would have one grade better in reading or whatever. Um, and then this pooled standard deviation where you have the S1 and the N1 and the S2 and the N2. Okay, and again, then you math, 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 math. Um, and we calculate it with our um, p-value and um, see if it's smaller than the alpha value that we picked. If there is a difference, we say we reject the null hypothesis and conclude there is statistically significant difference between the two groups or statistically significant evidence to support the difference, or you fail to find evidence that the two groups are different, right? And that's sort of a subtle distinction, right? We never prove the null hypothesis. We only fail to reject it because um, that could be a sign that our sample sizes aren't big enough. Of course, in this case, we have a pretty big sample size. So here's our data again. And now let's math. So um, we're going to check all the steps as we walk through it. So the null hypothesis is that there's no difference. The alternate hypothesis is that those who to go start at a community college are going to take longer than those at a four-year school. We check our assumptions. Of course, our sample central limit theorem is gigantic here, so that's not a problem at all because um, our sample sizes are huge. Then we math. So again, we plug in the two x bars, x bar one minus x bar two. That zero there is just because there's no difference to suspect it in the null hypothesis. S1, S2, N1, N2, math, 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 and we get a value of almost 13. Now you remember that a value of two is about where we think things start to get significant. And much of that idea about degrees of freedom is when you go in there and look at decimal points to think about how about two is a 2.1 or 2.0 or 1.96. 13 is bigger than all of those numbers. So that tells us that there is a significant difference. Um, we would look it up on the table. Degrees of freedom is 267. But man, is that different. So our conclusion is there is statistically significant evidence that students who first go to a community college take longer to attain a bachelor's degree compared to those who immediately go to a four-year school, right? And again, we're not making any causal arguments. We're not talking about how those uh, situations are different. But man, is there a difference between those two groups. All right. Here's another example. Um, I'll do one on StatCrunch here in a second, but let's do her example first. So this is data she collected last year comparing the freshmen and the non-freshmen in her Stat 90 class. So on the first test, the difference between them were an 83 and an 87, and a standard deviation of 7.3 versus 7.2. And she's going to calculate a 95% confidence interval. So instead of doing a hypothesis test, she's going to do a confidence interval. There we have our sample one, our sample two, and X bar S. So six numbers plus the stuff about T. All the assumptions are met because our sample sizes were both bigger than 30. 
<clears throat> she's going to find the number out of the table, which is 2.042. Remember, it's 1.96. Plus, it's a little bit bigger because of the T instead of Z distinction. 83 minus 87 is 4. I could have done that without a computer. This function I probably could not have done without a computer. Square root of 49 I can do. But you can't do that because remember, they're all inside the square root together. That number turns into 1.56. 494, and that gives us a confidence interval of minus 7.2 to minus 0.8. Because zero is not in that interval, that makes us think that that difference is significant. So the idea from her data is that non-freshmen do have a significantly higher score than freshmen do. Okay, and again, that's her data, so I don't know the story behind that, but that's what she found. All right, let's go to StatCrunch, and here is that data from lab one or lab zero that we did, man, it seems like 100 years ago now on the very first week of class where we uh, figured out how to use mini tab or stack crunch and we compared uh, heights and weights of men and women. In a way, the whole class has been building up to this because this is a data set we started with. Now we wrote the data like this. Stack crunch actually wants it in that form that I told you we don't want data to look like. Mini tab actually will use it like this and it has to be like this for mini tab, um, which is weird. But anyway, StatCrunch wants your data like this, where you just have a column of men and a column of women, or whatever your two groups are. Um, you guys know I'm new to StatCrunch, so maybe there's a way to do it the other way, but that's how I figured out how to do it. Anyway, this is a T test, two sample. Don't pick paired. That was what we did 11.2. You want two sample, and we have data. Then we have data for the male and data for the female identities that were given in the survey. Okay, now notice that I talked about pooling the variance. Uh, StackCrunch can actually do it either way, where you uh, pool the variance, or it can actually do a more complicated formula where you keep them separate. And you should be able to tell from the problem which one you do, although um, the default setting is that it's off. All right, so we're gonna compare the differences. Is the mean zero, or are we saying that mean one is bigger? So. Are we going to check to see if men on average are taller than women from our sample? Remember the sample size was pretty small, 22 people. Um, it is going to give you all the plots and stuff as you do that. And here, let's do a histogram too. Now let's do a p-value plot and a histogram. All right, so then we're going to go ahead and compare. Here's how it spits out. Notice there's all kinds of numbers here. Mu1, mu2, mu1 minus mu2. The null hypothesis is that they're equal. The alternate is that the men were taller than the women. Here's the difference, 5.4 with a standard error of 1.29 and a T statistic of 4.16. Probably not the most uh, staggering conclusion you've ever seen, but in fact, our data does say that men on average are taller than women with a p-value that's teeny, teeny, tiny. So that tells us that the difference is significant. Now the effect size 5.4 tells you that that's actually, you know, five inches is a pretty big difference between them. If we look at that chart, here's where it is. So the data we found falls over here. So it's very, very unlikely that you would get that data from chance alone. Let me run it one more time because I think I actually like to do uh, stat, t stat, two sample with data, male data, female data. We can pull the variances or not. You'll see the differences are very close. Um, as we do that, I'm going to click for the summary statistics too, because I kind of like that. And uh, oh, the histogram, which I forgot to look at last time. OK, so here is our result. I'll make this window a little bit bigger. So here is our summary statistics. Again, you calculated this on the first day of class. so. There were 10 men and 12 women with mean height 69.9 inches for men and 64.5. There's your 5.4 inch difference. The standard error, notice pooled standard error is a little bit less than either of them. 20 degrees of freedom because it does the more complicated thing. So it's actually sort of like the two minus two. It's a little average of the two. Our T statistic is still 4.2 and our P value is the same, 0. 0.0004. That's super significant. Here is our value. I did it as a two-sided two test, but again, it doesn't really matter. Here is our histogram. Notice that this is where the sample mean is um, for men, and here is where the mean is uh, for women. So we can see that that is um, 
different. Okay, so that's how StatCrunch does a t-test. Um, again, you're going to go in here, you're going to go t to sample, not paired unless you're doing a paired t-test from the other section. With data, if you just have the summary, you'll go in here, you'll put the mean standard deviation sample size, and it'll calculate it all for you. Again, whether or not you pull the variance or not should be in the question. Um, but when in doubt um, for the textbook, the textbook assumes that you do pull variances. Okay, and notice that it does have the summary statistics and the p-value plot, so you can look at those too. All right, so that is how to um, do the independent samples t-test chapter 11.3. That is really, um, again, these two sections. When we talk about doing real statistics, um, along with the proportion test we'll do in chapter 12 that we skipped from 11.1, .1, that's real statistics, right? Right now people are saying, you know, did one candidate get significantly more votes than the other candidate? And this test is how you would do that. Um, okay.